Hi everybody. Today we'll be focusing on the American Revolution, the social and political transformations that it led to, and the paradox that lay at the heart of the creation of the United States, meaning the contradiction between its stated ideals and the kind of government the colonies established when the fighting finally stopped. Here we have one of the most famous or infamous images, depending on one's perspective, that the Revolutionary War produced. It's Paul Revere's depiction of the so-called Boston Massacre of 1770, when British troops posted in the city opened fire on protesting colonists, killing five. It's all but forgotten that Paul Revere was a talented artist and propagandist, in addition to going on his legendary midnight ride, warning of a British invasion. His depiction of the events in Boston highlight the colonists' feeling that a massive crown conspiracy against their rights was underway. Revere even draws British snipers shooting down into the crowd from the upper stories of the surrounding buildings, something no one reported on either side at the time. The feeling of the colonists was that the king and parliament had overstepped their authority, first by blocking their access to western lands with the proclamation line of 1763, and after by drowning the colonies in taxes, not external taxes on imported luxuries, but internal taxes that the colonists viewed as illegitimate and punitive. Of course, from Parliament and the Crown's viewpoint, England had every right and power over the colonies to do with as they pleased. After all, they're called colonies for a reason. The French and Indian War was expensive, and the colonies would now have to pay their fair share. They would feel the hand of government in their everyday lives in a way they never had before. And in truth, this was the colonists' real grievance. Benjamin Franklin put it succinctly in his testimony before Parliament in 1766, when asked by members what the relationship of the colonies to the mother country was only years before, he said the colonists were happy because they were, in Franklin's words, led by a thread, meaning they were hardly governed at all. The profits from tobacco and rice were so impressive that Parliament and the Crown had no need to tax the colonies internally. But in the wake of the conflict with the French, not to mention the broader global battle for colonial possessions in the Seven Years' War, the British Treasury was nearly empty, and things had changed. By the time Franklin addressed Parliament, both sides were already knee-deep in what we know as the Imperial Crisis. The first piece of legislation that sparked genuine controversy after the Proclamation Line of 1763 was the Sugar Act of 1764. It amounted to an attempt by Parliament to boost sales and production of British rum and to finance the defense of the colonies by cracking down on the smuggling of molasses. What drew the colonists' ire was the setting up of special admiralty courts in Nova Scotia to hear smuggling cases, without juries and with a presumption of guilt. The Sugar Act spurred widespread protest in the colonies. Next, and still more offensive from the colonists' perspective, was the Stamp Act, passed by Parliament in March 1765. Again, the idea was to raise money for the defense of the colonies by levying a tax on legal documents, newspapers, and pamphlets, even decks of cards and bars. All had to be produced on special watermarked paper on which a tax was placed. The Stamp Act was the epitome of what the colonists called internal taxation without representation. 
if an individual wanted to import a fine bottle of French wine and Parliament wanted to levy a heavy tax on it, that was a perfectly legitimate external tax because presumably someone who could afford a bottle of high-end French wine could also afford to pay such a fee on a luxury, imported good. More importantly, from the colonist's vantage point, such an individual had chosen to import the wine. Therefore, they had elected to pay the tax. It was voluntary rather than coerced. The Stamp Act was an internal tax the colonies had not voted for, but were forced to pay any time they wanted to read a newspaper, get married, go into business, secure a loan, or even play cards with their friends in a tavern. It was unconscionable and a violation of their rights as Englishmen, or so the colonists argued, at first to no avail. From the perspective of Parliament and the Crown, Protest in the colonies against the Stamp Act turned ominous right from the start. As we can see in this illustration, colonists burned the watermarked Stamp Act paper in the streets of almost all the colonies. In Boston, the place that would become the nerve center of colonial resistance, a group of some of the city's most wealthy and influential citizens joined together to form what became known as the Sons of Liberty to lead and organize protests against the Stamp Act. Two of the organization's most prominent members we have here, Samuel Adams, the famous brewer and patriot, and John Hancock of the famous signature. For one year, the protests continued with stamp tax collectors, as we can see in these couple of images, often being hung in effigy, and most famously, of course, being tarred and feathered. For most of the month of October 1765, representatives from the 13 colonies met for what became known as the Stamp Act Congress, where nine of the 13 condemned the policy as unconstitutional because it was imposed without their consent. Finally, toward the end of March 1766, Parliament responded by issuing a so-called Declaratory Act, repealing the stamp tax, but also stating that Parliament had the right to legislate for the colonies in all cases whatsoever. A little over a year passed as Parliament hoped to allow for a cooling of temperatures in the colonies. But in June 1767, it passed what were known as the Townshend Duties, taxes on everything from glass, lead, and paint, to paper, and even tea. The colonial assemblies responded this time by condemning all forms of what they termed famously taxation without representation. Widespread protests began again, especially in Boston. Things escalated further toward the end of 1768 when Parliament determined to make an example of the Sons of Liberty and put an end to their agitation and violence dispatched British regular army troops to Boston, the infamous Redcoats. In March 1770 was the Boston Massacre. The next month, Parliament repealed the Townshend duties and went back to the drawing board in terms of trying to figure out a way to raise money out of the colonies. It finally settled in May 1773 upon what was called the Tea Act. Here we have a political cartoon of a colonist taking in a public notice of the act in Boston. To aid the faltering British East India Company, Parliament exempted its tea from import duties and allowed it to sell its product directly to the colonies. The reply was what we've come to know as the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> 
when members of the Sons of Liberty, dressed up as Mohawk Indians, dumped some 9,000 pounds of East India Company tea into Boston Harbor. The moment's been memorialized in art countless times, and here we have a few sketches from artists' interpretations over the years. This time, Parliament had had enough. In May 1774, it issued the Intolerable Acts, which effectively shut down the city of Boston and stripped it of self-government. That September, delegates from the colonies met for the first Continental Congress to discuss opposition to the Intolerable Acts. Paul Revere's famous Midnight Ride and the first shots of the American Revolution at Lexington and Concord were only months away. Here we have a couple of images from the battles of Lexington and Concord fought in April 1775. The first one dates to the period, and the second one is a much more recent artistic interpretation of the battle, or battles. What sparked the engagement was British intelligence that the colonial militias had stockpiled arms at Lexington, and they determined to come and confiscate them. The intention was to take the town by surprise, but Paul Revere's spies ruined the plan. The colonists obviously lost these battles, but within a couple of months, the Continental Congress had placed George Washington, as we see in this image, at the head of a new Continental Army, and determined to stand up for what they deemed their rights. We have a, another famous portrait painting of Washington from the time. The day after his appointment, June 17th, 1775, was the Battle of Bunker Hill, just outside Boston. This was another American defeat, but the British lost over 1,000 troops, and it proved to the colonists that they could stand up and fight against trained British regulars. Again, this was a contest that's been re you know, reproduced in art many, many times over. Here are just a few interpretations produced over the years of the Battle of Bunker Hill. In July 1775, King George III, who we have here in this painting, formally declared the colonies in open rebellion and rejected the last-ditch effort for peace by the Continental Congress, the so-called Olive Branch Petition, which called for a recognition of American rights and a repeal of the Intolerable Acts in exchange for a ceasefire. Then at the start of 1776, in January, Thomas Paine, who we see here, anonymously published his famous immortal pamphlet, Common Sense, in Philadelphia, telling the colonists famously that these are the times that try men's souls, and calling upon them to throw off the tyranny of monarchical rule in favor of a government of the people. 
Here we have a photo of an original edition of Payne's work. As we know, on July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress fulfilled Payne's vision by issuing the Declaration of Independence. While George Washington desperately tried to keep his Continental Army in the field and to wear the British out by always surviving to fight another day, an intense diplomatic effort was underway in France, mostly led by Benjamin Franklin, but also John Adams, to try and win French aid and support. And after July 1776, recognition of American independence. Here we have a painting of Franklin at the court of the French king in 1775. The French government did begin sending covert assistance to the colonies as early as May 1776, but it did not recognize their independence just yet. France hedged its bets against the likelihood that the British would eventually win the war and suppress the rebellion. During these trying years of the conflict, American patriots, as they came to be known, those who wholeheartedly supported independence, found all sorts of ways to get behind the effort, especially American women. This is a portrait painting of Mercy Otis Warren. She was the wife of James Warren, a prominent Massachusetts politician and paymaster for Washington's army during the war. She was a political writer and propagandist who adamantly believed in the independence movement, even holding meetings of the Sons of Liberty in her house. In some ways, her well-connected status, especially, Warren was unique. But in other ways, she was typical of American patriot women during the Revolution, in that she not only wanted to contribute to the war effort and the political drive for independence, she also wanted public recognition of her patriotism and contributions. Women in America contributed to the cause in ways that women have in all wars historically, sending food and sewing clothes and uniforms, traveling with the armies as cooks, laundresses, and nurses, and sometimes even dressing up as men and fighting themselves. But the most public and politically radical contribution of Patriot women during the war amounted to their years-long boycott of British goods, especially tea. Determined to make the crown pay a heavy economic price, they emptied all the British tea out of their homes, often taking it to the local town square and setting it ablaze in huge bonfires. Such events turned into major political rallies in support of independence. The high profile of women's patriotism during the war foreshadowed a more prominent and public role and political one for women after the conflict ended. Another group who saw their role in the colonies begin to change dramatically were African Americans, both free and enslaved. In the northern colonies, many began to agitate for an end to slavery during the revolutionary years, calling out the obvious. How could a country that claimed to be fighting for the universal rights of humankind simultaneously hold an entire race of people in perpetual bondage? Not a few northern colonies responded by either ending slavery outright during the war or putting it on a course toward extinction through a process called gradual abolition. Only New York and New Jersey, the two northern colonies with the largest slave populations, failed to adopt such a course during the revolutionary period. Thousands of black men from the north joined the Continental Army and fought for the Patriot cause. In the southern colonies, Largely, slave societies were the institution shaped virtually all aspects of life for both black and white colonists 
a different kind of story played out altogether. If the northern colonies became less attached to slavery during the revolution and more willing to part with it, the colonies of the south became more wedded to human bondage than ever before. That's because in the south the Revolutionary War turned into a civil war. One fought to either destroy or defend slavery. In 1775, John Murray, Lord Dunmore, who we see in this portrait painting, the British colonial governor of Virginia during the war, issued what became known as Dunmore's Proclamation. It provocatively offered freedom to any slave of a patriot master in revolt against the crown, who fled to the king's standard and joined with British military forces in attempting to put down the rebellion. As a result of Dunmore's proclamation, which we can see a copy of here, thousands of slaves fled the tobacco plantations to take the governor up on his offer of freedom. Because joining the British meant freedom, in the South, unlike in the North, more black men, like the soldier we see imagined in this painting, joined with the British by far way more join with the British than with the Americans. In addition, the promise of freedom as it came to be adopted elsewhere in the southern colonies by other royal governors meant that a British victory in the conflict would result in the end of slavery, ruining the planter class of the South. This reality forced a renewed commitment to slavery in the southern colonies, and they fought to protect it as hard as they fought for their own freedom and independence. In fact, they started to believe that their liberty depended upon the continued existence of slavery. They could not live without it. If we could go back and conduct a public opinion poll of the colonists at the start of the Revolutionary War, we would likely find feelings evenly divided into thirds, with a third of those surveyed being strongly in support of the Patriot cause and independence, a third neutral and hoping to stay out of the conflict, and a third loyalists to the Crown and Parliament, known in the colonies as Tories, like the character portrayed in this political cartoon of the era. Over time, as in all wars, those in the neutral camp, with armies on the ground, found their positions untenable and were forced to one side or the other, Patriots or Tories. For the first couple of the years of the fighting, it remained unclear which direction people on the fence would move in. But a major battle fought on the plains of upstate New York at a place called Saratoga in mid-October 1777 changed all that. It was here that American forces, for the first time in the war, defeated a sizable British army in a major engagement. It convinced the French that the Americans might just be able to win their independence if they had the proper assistance. Here we have a famous painting of the British General Burgoyne surrendering to the American General Horatio Gates at Saratoga. By February 1778, France had recognized American independence and started readying French troops for deployment to the colonies. It was a clear turning point in the war, and one that boded well for the Patriot cause. Scholars virtually all agree that without outside help, the Americans could never have held on and won their independence from Great Britain. French military support was critical and never on greater display 
than in the siege that brought an end to the war at Yorktown, Virginia, in October 1781. It was there that American and French land forces, supported by a French naval fleet, surrounded and ultimately cut off from their supplies the army of British General Charles Cornwallis, who was forced to surrender his command of over 5,000 troops, as well as himself. It was a moment captured in another famous painting of the period, which we have here. Yorktown convinced the British to negotiate an end to the American Revolution, to recognize the colonists' independence. The formal end of the war would not come until the signing of what was known as the Treaty of Paris in 1783. When the colonists declared their independence, in 1776, they argued that all mankind was endowed with certain God-given inalienable rights, chief among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here we see the original copy of the Declaration of Independence with all its famous signatures. Now that the former colonies had won their freedom, they could fairly be judged on how well they fulfilled that vision. Did the leaders of the new United States intend to create a government that reflected the ideal of universal human freedom or something well short of it? How far were they willing to go to make the ideals of the Declaration of Independence real for all Americans? The famous painting of the signing of the document goes a long way toward answering the question. When we look at it, the most pointed question we might ask is not who is there, but who is not represented in the image. There certainly are no women to be found, not even a Mercy Otis Warren. There are no black faces and no Indians either. Nor are there any poor white men. None of these groups were included in the original definition of American citizenship. Only white men of a certain propertied economic status would enjoy the title of citizen fully, meaning they had the right to vote. The question of rhetoric versus reality is a critical one in our national history, one that every generation of Americans from the very first one has had to navigate and define for itself. When the revolution ended, American women attempted to expand their influence on the shaping of the new nation. They had won much acclaim for their patriotic fervor and support of the war for independence. And now that it was over, they looked for a way to continue aiding in the creation of the fledgling republic. The strategy that women like Mercy Otis Warren and her contemporary Judith Sargent Murray, also an activist and writer, settled upon was to emphasize the role of mothers in a democratic republican system of government, such as the United States hoped to establish. Here we have a portrait painting of Judith Sargent Murray. Unlike in a monarchy where all power rests in a single individual, the king or queen, in a democratic republic, power is dispersed resting not in a single person, but in all those defined as citizens, and was expressed in the right to vote. In order for such a system to work, for it to avoid sinking into corruption and abuses of power by those at the top, citizens had to hold government accountable, had to watch out for the telltale signs of corruption, and be willing to remove officials who betrayed the public interest. 
fulfilling this crucial role of citizen required what in the language of the day was called Republican virtue. An ability not just to hold government accountable and watch it with a critical eye, but also a willingness to put aside one's selfish, private interests when necessary in support of the public good of all people of the Democratic Republic. Pretty clearly people were not born with this ability, women like Warren and Murray noted. They had to be educated to it, raised with the kind of knowledge and principles that produced Republican virtue in men. And of course, before they were men, they were sons. And who raised sons in the late 18th and early 19th century? Almost exclusively their mothers in every practical way. They called their idea Republican motherhood. At its core lay the notion that women were vital to the success or failure of the Republic itself because they were the ones responsible for producing and for nurturing its future citizens. This being the case, Warren, Murray, and others argued, women and girls required more educational opportunities and across a wider array of subjects than just letters, music, and dance. They needed to understand the workings of political economy, markets, math, and science as well. The concept of Republican motherhood did not win citizenship and voting rights for women, but what it did do was lead to more schools for girls and instruction in a much wider array of topics, just as its proponents called for. The logic which argued there could be no virtuous Republican citizens without virtuous Republican mothers was undeniable. And it was heard. This is a sketch portrait of the Bishop Richard Allen of Philadelphia. A slave in the Northern colonies, he managed to purchase his freedom during the revolution in 1780. Allen sought opportunity in Ben Franklin's Philadelphia because it was already at this point becoming a center of free black community growth in the North, and not a few black businesses had been created there. While he also followed this route, setting up a profitable painting enterprise, for example, Allen in 1784 entered the ministry of the Methodist Church and it was this religious calling, along with black freedom, that became the focus of his life. In 1787, Allen and another black Methodist minister, Absalom Jones, broke away from the official Methodist church, which remained segregated according to race. Allen bought a piece of real estate in Philadelphia upon which he planned to build an independent black church. It took years to construct, but by 1794 it opened as the Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. We see it in this sketch as it originally looked. And this is what it looks like today from the outside. The entire structure is the work of free black labor. The inside, which we can see in this photograph, is truly breathtaking. Every piece of woodwork handcrafted by skilled black artisans of the period. Independent black churches in the North, like Allen's, became the center of free black communities after the revolution. They functioned 
not just as places of worship, but as schools, as political and social meeting places, and as the site of mutual aid societies. Sometimes, and not that infrequently as in Allen's case, they served as stations or intelligence depots for the Underground Railroad that aided fugitive slaves on the route to freedom. Unfortunately, what free black Americans in the North found was that although their numbers increased with every passing year, so too did white prejudice against them, especially in places where their population was the most dense and where they enjoyed some economic success in building their own institutions, like Allen's Church in Philadelphia. As blacks came to enjoy and exert their free status, it rankled northern whites, who began looking for ways to limit the boundaries of black liberty, especially in cities. If American women fell short of the definition of citizen, free blacks faced growing racial hostility and prejudice in the North, and in the South, black Americans stared down the barrel of a commitment to slavery that was stronger than before the war. But Indians faced Armageddon. When the revolution began, some tribes aligned themselves with the Patriot cause but the overwhelming majority sided with the British. It was a no-brainer for most of them. The British government and its proclamation line was the only thing preventing a flood of white settlement into Indian lands in the West. Here we have a portrait painting of Joseph Brandt, chief of the Mohawk Nation during the war. The Iroquois allied with the British early on and ended up paying for it by seeing the five nations dissolved as a power along the Atlantic seaboard by the time the conflict ended. Here we have a couple more sketches depicting the Indian relationship with the British during the revolution. They had little choice. An American victory meant a growing and more rapid deterioration of their world. They fought desperately to hold on to it and lost. Our last image here shows the original 13 states of the Union. Over a century earlier, the Indians of the Chesapeake and New England regions had been removed as any kind of threat to white settlement. The revolution succeeded in doing the same to the five nations. This meant that as the new United States looked to expand all the way from Virginia to the Mid-Atlantic and New England, there was no longer any immediate obstacle standing in their way. The Indians of the American interior knew what was coming and did their best to brace for it. All right, so that gets us through the American Revolution. Next time we'll focus on the very beginnings of the United States, the Constitutional Convention of 1787 at Philadelphia, and the competing political visions that shaped the nation at its inception.